everyone. It's time for a, another podcast here with the Film Yep crew, and I'm joined by my old friend, uh, Bob Bloom, a uh, founding member of the Indianapolis Film Journalists Association, as am I, and just four others with the passing of Edward Johnson Ott. Just five OGs of us left. Uh, Bob, it's great to have you with us. Well, thank you, and I like that you didn't emphasize the word old. Yeah, well, you and me both, unfortunately. We were quite a bit younger, if you can believe it. Uh, the awards we just came out was our 15th. Yep. 15, 15 years. The organization has been around, well, 14 and change, but we started in early 2009, so hard to believe. Uh, and obviously some uh, momentous news from you, uh, which is, uh, well, I won't steal your thunder. I think you've already kind of announced this on your social medias and everything, but uh, tell us what your big news is for 2024. Well, basically, uh, for various, I guess, health and cognizant and mental reasons, I'm going to be cutting back on actual film reviews. I'm still going to be doing the weekly new to view, you know, 4K Blu ray DVD column, but uh, I'll just give you basically the nutshell reasons for this. Uh, the health reasons are um, basically I can't drive at night anymore. My mm -hmm. eyes are just going. So either I have to convince uh, my wife to go to a movie with me, and there are various movies she doesn't like. She likes dramas, historical stuff, and, you know, fiction and comedies but you know superhero movies are out and any kind of like horror film thriller she's sort of you know eh. so that's that so if if nick's nick rogers our, our colleague is going to a movie and he invites me to go with him i'll be able to go or now that i have the screening services i'll just catch up with the movie on a screening service uh and the other reason, uh, I guess one of the, the mental reasons is I just don't like sitting in theaters with people anymore. <laughs> I mean, I've reached the point where, you know, we've talked about this before, how people now think when they're in a movie theater, they're just in a larger version of their living room. Yeah. And they're, I don't want to go rude because it's more like they just don't know how to behave in a movie theater anymore. Yeah. So that's the other reason. And the third reason, the cogniz cognitivity reason, cognitivity, is that a word? Who yeah. knows? See, that's, I am having issues writing. I used to be able to just knock out a review and think of the correct word or phrase that I wanted to use. And now it, I, I reach stages where I have to, you know, stop. I have to actually walk away for a while and actually, you know, wait a second, is this the right word? Is this, it's like the words don't come as easily as they used to. And yeah, it could, it, I could just keep going and it would take me longer to write something. But I also just have this feeling that I'm just not a hundred percent and I don't want to be, do something at even 90 or 95%. I'm not a hundred percent. And there's one more sort of a reason I'm getting the spark, I guess that used to have about movie reviews or review, seeing movies and reviewing them is is going out. I mean, there's a lot of movies this year. You know, I, I love superhero movies, yet I didn't go. I mean, the last one I saw was The Marvels. I didn't see Blue Beetle. I haven't seen Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. I mean, Blue Beetle's now on uh, HBO when it shows up there. You know, if I see it's on maybe i'll watch it the same with you know when aquaman shows up on max or on uh, hbo i'll watch it then but the the fire's sort of diminishing it's like you know 
a bonfire that, you know, when it, uh, when it starts, it's way, you know, it's way big. Well, now it's sort of almost down to embers. Yeah. So in a nutshell, that's the reasons for what I'm doing. Okay. So we're not, I don't want to embarrass the IFJA by doing anything that would diminish the group. Oh, I think we've embarrassed ourselves plenty over the years, but also done a lot of great things. So, um, so I guess I'm not sure if you're calling this your retirement because you're obviously not stepping completely away. You're still going to do your video column and may pop in for some screenings here and there. But still, it, it seems like, it, you know, you've you've mentally and emotionally reached sort of like the end of an era. And I don't blame you or anyone for losing the spark over time. Uh, of course, you know, all of us who do this, you know, um, you know, for all of us, it's a side gig. Um, thing that we do it's not you know what we make our living from you know the movie criticism gang uh, gig has not been remunerative remunerative for most of us for many many years uh, and like anybody even if it was everyone reaches a natural retirement age um, you know that's not too far too too far off for me I mean I'm definitely in the pipeline of looking down there and you actually retired from the newspaper life yourself a few years ago but kept yeah. doing it's actually it'll be uh in november it was nine years so yeah i'm 75 now so you know i'm sort of the old man of the group yeah well this way i mean not too many firefighters keep doing what they're doing after retirement age or whatever you know where they decide to hang them up um but you know we keep going we keep doing what we do because we love it um but i understand you know obviously Things change as time goes by, and I'm glad you're going to keep doing the video column, the nude of you, always one of our most popular items here on the film app every week. Um, so we're very glad to, to host that as, as long as you are willing to do it. But speaking of things changing, could you talk a little bit about how the movie criticism game has changed? And I wanted to put a number on this. I wasn't quite sure I've got it, got it right, but I believe – Overall, you've done this for almost 50 years? Uh, yeah, I started, okay, a little background. As, as a youth in high school, my dream was to be a sports writer. And I was the sports editor of my high school paper. Went to college, you know, at Ohio University down in Athens because they had a great journalism school. And... One of the biggest regrets of my life is I didn't go work for the uh, Ohio University Post, which is one of the best you know, student newspapers in the country. And that's because uh, first two years I spent at college, I was busy in, you know, true confessions. I was too busy drinking and doing other things in between class. And then the last two years, I sort of got radicalized. And thoughts with what was going on in the country, sports was irrelevant. Mm. But, you know, I got a, in 1970, I got a news, when I graduate, excuse me, technically didn't graduate when the National Guard escorted us off campus in 1970. Everyone remembers that infamous year. Uh, I got a job at the uh, Sun in Springfield, Ohio. Worked there at various jobs through the years. And then around 1976, one of the editors asked, hey, if anybody wants to start any kind of column, come and talk to me about it. And we'll see what we could do. Well, I wanted this. I had been reviewing uh, what, the, what they had in Springfield Civic Theater. And I enjoyed doing, you know, reviewing that. So I said, yeah, I'd like to do an entertainment column. And I started that. They had a holiday in there where they had acts come in, which were very bad. So after a while, between it just basically um, dwindled down to uh, theatrical productions and visiting theatricals and visiting celebrities. Uh, I mean, I interviewed Vincent Price twice, two of the greatest memories of my life. Interviewed Jeffrey Holder. I don't know if you remember who he was. And then I decided, hey, I'm going to start doing movies. I had a friend in town who was the, he worked for the local movie theater. So through him, I was able to get into the local theater, uh, see uh, movies. 
And uh, then I, he hooked me up with, uh, places like the Owens Group, so I was able to start driving from Springfield to Columbus, Ohio, to you know uh, review movies there. So I started more and more reviewing movies. Uh, am I taking too much on this? No. In seventy in uh, nineteen, I don't remember what it was eighty eighty one. I got a job at the Dispatch in Columbus, where I sort of became the backup movie critic to the guy who was the movie critic there and then when the two newspapers merged the guy from the columbus citizen journal became the number one critic and i backed him up uh we moved here to lafayette in 92 and uh, the two weeks before i was supposed to move here carol had already moved here she had a job first so i was following her here uh, when I got the job at the Journal and Courier two weeks before, the person who was reviewing movies once in a while left. So a couple months after I got there and got myself settled, I started, I asked, hey, you want somebody to review movies? They said, yeah. First movie I reviewed for them was Chaplin. So what was that, 1993? Yeah, anyway, 92 or 93. Yeah, I, so that was the first movie I did. And I was doing it for the paper until uh, I took the buyout and left. Uh, waited a week or so, took a breath, and started the uh, column. I figured, why not keep doing it? It's fun. I don't need to get paid for it. I wasn't getting paid for it at the JNC. I was, you know, like you um, and other people. I my full time job was I was a copy editor. Yeah. And on my nights off or night off, I'd go do a movie review. So that was basically it. Yeah. Uh, that's the one thing that's changed, I, I, you know, really more so in the last few years is people understand that, you know, how we see the movies is generally there are screenings that are shown in theaters ahead of time. Sometimes it's just a couple of days. Sometimes it's a couple of weeks. Um, and though that has changed a lot over the last few years. But especially with COVID, now and now, as Bob mentioned, we have these screening services. There's like special press websites where you get a special uh, password protected link. Various ways where we'll watch it on our computer or whatever or on our TV um, at home. That tends to be still for the more, you know, the, either for awards consideration at the end of the year or for the, you know, medium to smaller independent foreign language films. The big, big movies, still like the Marvels and stuff like that, they don't send us a screening. We can't screen that at home. We still have to go to the theater. Um, so one one big way the thing has changed, and I mean, another way you just mentioned, of course, is the old timers, which is to say you and me and Matthew Sosi and Edward when he was alive. You know, we all started, uh, Nick Rogers as well, we all started in newspapers. Like, that was the only game in town. Um, there was a few TV critics um, here and there, uh, when I say movie cr critics working on television, but not not a whole lot. Um, now, you know, now we look at the uh, most of the newer members of the IFJA who have joined in the last 10, 12 years. You know, they never worked at a newspaper. They just, you know, had the passion. And, you know, typically a lot of them, you know, found a website or started a podcast or something. And that's how they came up. Yeah. The one thing I do miss is, uh, you know, the the deadline pressure. And I think that's one thing that has sort of dulled my senses a little is, you know, I'd come back from a movie and, uh, you know, just, you know, just sit down and have to dash it out. You know, I'd write it home and email it to the entertainment editor. I mean, I remember a couple of times I actually dictated reviews over the phone because they were Thursday Thursday night reviews and they were actually holding a spot in the, you know, entertainment section for the review. So, you know. Yeah, that's the that, great thing. That, about were, that The adrenaline rush was nice. Yeah, I mean, it, it 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 forced you to have discipline as a writer, as a thinker, as a critic. Um, I mean, it's the one great thing about doing things on the web is, you know, you can publish on your own time. There's no one to sit there and say, you've only got 600 words. Um, you can write as long as you want. 
Um, but yeah, uh, that there was sort of that built-in structure right. that is different now. I mean, and I think you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I look at um, some of the younger folks in the IFGA who have come up, like uh, uh, Andy Carr. I mean, he never, you know, had that experience working with newspapers or that structure. But I mean, I think he's become a damn fine critic and writer. Um, several others, you know, the, a bunch that we can name as well. So I mean, it is possible, I think, to come up in the the craft of movie criticism without that. Um, but I do think people like you and me appreciate having had it. Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, there we have a bunch of good writers. I mean, Evan, Mitch, you know, I they're they're good. They they they're able to express themselves and you know, uh working for a newspaper is not a prerequisite to be a critic. I mean, yeah. well it's just that was the way you had to do it back then. There was no internet, so yeah. you know, like you know, I you, I still have them. I've received, I still have most of the letters, which isn't that many, maybe a couple dozen. I receive from people, you know, either praising a review or calling me an unmentionable name. Yeah. But I save them both because. Uh, it's part of the learning experience when doing the review. I mean, I remember mistakes I've made in reviews, uh, you know, and I remember some of the good stuff I've done. Now, Bob, you've got a great story that um, I you've told me, and I'm sure I've told others, but maybe you'd be willing to tell it here. It's about the circumstances under which you saw the original Star Wars. Would you mind sharing that, like, or at least like sure. the condensed version of it? Sure. I, I believe it was, let's see, Star Wars came out Memorial Day in 77, right? Right about okay. there. In April of 77, uh, like I said, I had this friend who worked for the local theater chain in Springfield. Uh, he was sort of a blowhard, he, but he was a nice guy. But the one thing was he couldn't drive. So he said, hey, there." 20th Century Fox is screening this science fiction movie down in Cincinnati for a science fiction club. I have a friend down there. He can get us in. The only thing is you can't let anybody know you're a movie critic. So I said, okay, Cincinnati, it's 90 miles from Springfield about. It's an hour and a half drive. It's worth going down there for. So we drove down to the movie, you know, got into the theater and Star Wars starts, and, you know, being, uh, as you and a lot of the gang know, I am a fan of the old serials, the old movie serials from the 30s and 40s. And when Star Wars began and they had that scroll up, I just said right then and there, oh, this is for me. And, uh, yeah, so we come out of the movie and my head is spinning. and. I know, you know, I have a month to write a review and I have, I can't even tell anybody at the paper where I've been because I didn't have to be at work till four. I worked at the a morning paper. The sun was a morning paper. I didn't have to be at work till four. The screening was at 11 in the morning. So, you know, got back in time to be at work and uh, it sat there for a month. You know, I wrote the review actually typed it remember typewriters <laughs> I, I actually typed it up at home and then took the review into the paper and you know i think i don't even remember now we didn't even have computer uh computers that it was 77 so oh, i that. took i took the review i'd written at home and took it into the paper you know when my deadline was to get it published and it was one of the longest reviews i wrote and yeah, I still cherish that. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's like seeing, watching Leonardo da Vinci paint the Mona Lisa. Did he paint the Mona Lisa? Yeah. yeah. Painting the Mona Lisa and having to keep quiet about it. Same yeah. sort of adrenaline rush you'd get doing that. Yeah, that's just such a great, great story. Having seen the movie like more than a month in advance and, you know, you knew and no one else knew. Yeah. Just a great feeling. Any other particular memories, uh, whether it's a movie or an interview with a celebrity or a moment, just, you know, things yeah, that I can tell you about the one regret I had in my life. Okay. Uh, 
But when I was, uh, I think it was still, yeah, I was still working in Springfield. Uh, Robert Redford came to uh, Columbus to promote uh, for a press conference. They were going to be starting to film his prison movie, Brew Baker, over in Mansfield, Ohio, which was, well, you know, about 30, 40 miles from Columbus. And uh, afterward, I went up to the, uh, uh, one of the producers who was there and said, you know, I introduced myself, told him who I was. I said, you know, I, could I come in and do a gig being an extra in the movie? And you got to remember at this time I had a little beard and I actually had hair. And he said, yeah, we could get you in as a prisoner, but you'd have to shave your beard and we'd have to cut your hair. And I had longish hair at the time. So youth, uh, the folly of youth, and it wasn't really youth. I was 30 years old at the time, but still rather vain. I said, uh, give me your phone number. I'll think about it. And I just never did it. I said, no, I don't want to cut my hair. I don't want to shave my head. So that is my really one of my biggest regrets that I didn't do that. Probably would have wound up on the cutting room floor, but still, you know, to participate, it would have been fun. Yeah. Any other, uh, what about the interviews? I know, you know, interviews with celebrities, people, you know, are intrigued by them. I've done a bunch of them. I can't say is that I really necessarily enjoy doing them. Usually the, the there's so much hassle involved in negotiating and scheduling, right. getting the access that, by the time you actually get plopped in front of them, you're, and then a lot of times it's just like, you've literally got like five minutes or 10 minutes. Yeah. That's the but, thing. I know. I can't really remember that many people that I've interviewed. Uh, I know I interviewed Spike Lee once. I don't even remember which movie it was for. Uh, and then the weirdest thing was a few years after I interviewed him, he came to Purdue to give a talk and there was this one scene in uh, Malcolm X, and this was at, way after I reviewed him, that I just really impressed me. And, you know, I'm one of my problems about movies is I'm one of those technical geeks. I want to know how things were done. You know, so there's this scene where uh, Malcolm X is on his way to the uh, the ballroom where he's going to get assassinated and he's like floating on air. So yeah. I asked, uh, I got a chance to ask Spike Lee, how did you accomplish that? He said, we just had him stand on something and we just pulled it. Yeah. And I said, Simple as that. And he said, yep. So, you know, it's, it's stuff like that. When the weird thing is when I would interview somebody, I would always ask him weird questions about, mm -hmm. You know, why they chose this actor, if it was the director, why they chose this actor for a role, if it was an actor, why he decided to do this movie. You know, it was, it was weird stuff like that. You know, I let him, I know that you had to talk to them about the movie they were doing, but I also was able to get in the kind of questions that I was interested in, you know. So, you know, that's uh, basically... Uh, how my interview process went. Okay. So. Well, Bob, thanks for taking the time. I, I've got a couple more questions to, to round wrap things up with you. Uh, and it's ones that people, people like us critics often get, at least this one is uh, people always ask me, what's your favorite movie of all time? And I always have the hardest time answering that, you know, it's like choosing amongst your many, many children, but right. can you do that? What's your favorite movie? My favorite movie that's a hard one because I have a lot of favorite movies. If I had to pick my favorite movie, it would be the original King Kong from 1933. I mean, even when that Great comes, story. even then when, even when that comes on TV and I have a Blu-ray of it and it's on TNT, you know, like five or six times, I will watch, you know, King Kong. I'll even go in the back room and watch it. So I don't have to get the, this, you know, my wife looking at me and just shaking her head and telling me, uh, oh, you know, again, you know, I don't know if you've gotten that from your wife. 
you know, you'll see, she'll say again, you know, is that the, that's all she, that's all she has to say. And I'll just look at her and say, yeah. And, you know, uh, it's like, that's my favorite movie. My two favorite genres that I like watching. I like to watch my old serials and I watch them over and over again. Some of them I've watched five or six times. So when there's even, you know, you have those cliffhangers, I know he's going to get out of it, but I don't care. So I like those. I like uh, the classic horror movies from uh, the Universals because my father was the one who got me into those when I was a little kid, and I mean little. Yeah. Uh, and probably what other too, movie? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Too, probably too little, but that's okay. No, I was about seven or eight when – no, let's see. Yeah, it was about – no, eight, yeah, seven or eight when the uh, shock theater package came to TV with all the universal features. And another movie that stands out for me is The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Mm. And that's because, well, two reasons. One, it introduced me to Ray, Harryhau Ray Harryhausen's work. And secondly, it was the first time I was able to go to a movie theater on my own. Uh, living, growing up on Long Island, we didn't have a neighborhood movie theater until the North Massapequa Theater opened up about a mile from my home, and they had, you know, what be, what you'd call then kitty matinees. The first movie they had was The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, and oh my god! And I was at that theater for the next like three or four years religiously every saturday basically every 50s film science fiction horror film they were catching up and showing them and that was my home away from home and between that and uh that theater and something we had on tv million dollar movie uh that's i guess if i had to pick what sparked my interest and in, basically made me my love of films and maybe actually helped me become a critic. It was those movies. Okay. Uh, well, actually I thought of one more, but uh, uh, when we go see movies for at press screenings or whatever, you know, they usually have like a specific row where they like stick the press. Like you have to sit in this row, but if that constraint is removed, what is your favorite place to sit in a movie theater? I like to try to get middle, 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 just about dead center. A little, maybe a row or two before now, my eyes are going, but yeah, a little closer to the screen, but in the middle. The problem is having a seat like that, you have people around you. <laughs> All right. And the last one I just thought of, obviously doing the video column, you and I are both big physical media guys. We love having the actual DVDs, Blu-rays and 4K right. and, you know, being Facebook friends with you, I've seen shots of like your collection from time to time. Do you know, do you have an idea exactly how many discs you have in your video library? Yeah, because I have this uh, uh, app that keeps track of all the things I have. So it's about 3,900 uh, Blu-rays, DVDs, 4Ks, TV series, you know, stuff I've had that I've kept. A lot of it, some of it's because, you know, my wife liked this TV show, so... You know, I've saved it for uh, a lot of, because a lot of the TV shows I like. But yeah, I have, uh, like I said, about 3,900. It's like a whole room. It's like a whole room in your house, isn't it? Actually, it's a room and a half. I mean, well, hold on a sec. I will show you why I don't have the lights on. Okay. Pause, okay. pause it for a sec. Oh. Sure. Yeah. So there is. All right. You know, that's just part of it. That's just part of it. Yeah, and there's the other room basically has uh stuff like box sets and most mostly TV series. It's just stand up and it's it's just like a takes up a fourth of the room. But <laughs> cool. I go through stuff and you know, every maybe twice a year I purge, you know, yeah. if it's, I have like a, a rule. If there's something I haven't watched for like four or five years, I'm never going to watch it 
or if it's something that you know is in heavy rotation on HBO or Stars or something, I'll just say the heck with it. But there's some movies that you know are dear and dear to me that I will just hold on to forever. Yeah, or will actually do retire and just have nothing to do but sit around and watch TV. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the the home of a true movie lover there. And Bob, I've I've truly loved uh, starting IFGA with you and the other original gang and watching it grow in a fantastic organization of two dozen plus people. And just want to let you know everyone know how much we appreciate you for everything you've done with your magnificent career. And you know, uh, like we say, the the, the video column is going to keep going indefinitely. And uh, we just really appreciate you. And I'm glad to call you a colleague and a friend. Well, I appreciate that. Oh, by the way, you did ask, but I will tell you, the worst movie I ever reviewed and the worst re- the the worst movie, I mean, it was a review. I was just so happy to just decimate. It was a movie called Idle Hands. It was a <laughs> horror film. I just just hated it. So that yeah. if you want, you got the best and now you got the worst. All right. Well, Bob, you're the very best and I really appreciate you, man. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.